Hey everyone, my name is Boulevard. I'm a caster, a master rank player, and I've done balance work for a couple of card games in the past. This patch I think is going to be much bigger and more warping than last patch. A lot of the problems that we're seeing are recurring ones, and I think a few reworks might be in order, about four to be exact. Now I'm not saying that all of these have to get reworked, in fact I think only one or none of them actually will, but I'm talking about Ezreal, Heimerdinger, They Who Endure, and Pilfer. So let's get into this rundown, and I'll tell you guys what I think is we're going to see in patch 1.4. So the first thing I want to do is actually revisit the cards that I predicted to get nerfed in patch 1.2 that didn't, and sort of reevaluate where I stand on them now. So first up, we have Scythria the Bold. Do I still think Scythria needs a nerf? The answer is pretty much no. I really just wanted them to nerf something alongside Loyal Badger Bear, and they ended up hitting Grizzled Ranger instead. Second off, we have Legion Grenadier. Does this card still need to be nerfed? Again, no. Again, I just really wanted a second nerf out of the archetype, and they ended up hitting Legion Rearguard instead. Number three, we have Atrocity. Do I still think this card needs to get nerfed? The answer is yes. We're still seeing it pop up in over half of Shadow Isle decks across all different archetypes. I think it's actually up closer to like 70-75% now as it's appearing in pretty much every Karina deck I've seen, a large portion of Sea Monsters, and of course every Indoor Spiders deck. Unyielding Spirit is actually kind of a weird one. Do I think that it still needs a nerf? Yes, I do. The problem is that I don't think it's going to get nerfed this patch because it really hasn't seen much play. I just think that this card is overall bad for the longevity of the game and will eventually become a problem again, but I think short term, it's not going to be that big of an issue. And finally, we have Ezreal. Do I still think Ezreal needs to be nerfed? Yes, I do. This is a change that was proposed by Riot sort of themselves. This is how Ezreal works in the tutorial. Uh, he still deals two damage in the tutorial instead of one on the flip side, but I think you would have, obviously have to bring that in line a little bit since, you know, you are reducing the number of targets. But I think this is the Ezreal rework that I've kind of settled on. I don't think I'd be mad at anything they do to him, really, but I do think the overall power level of this card is a little bit too high. So that wraps up everything that I had wanted to see nerfed in patch 1.2 that didn't get nerfed. Now let's get into the new stuff. Since I typically look at tournament data over ladder, my perceptions of power are going to be a little skewed by that. That said, Sea Monsters is really good. Not oppressive, but really good, so I wanted to make a minor change. Overall, I'm mostly happy with the way Sea Monsters plays. I think they're hitting deep at a reasonable timing, average turn 6 or 7. I think their late game is strong, but heavily Nautilus focused, which is fine, that's how the card was designed to be used, but I wanted to propose a small Jaw Hunters change. Nautilus feels like he's in a good spot because Sea Monsters only runs about 7 to 8 Sea Monsters on average three copies of Abyssal Eye, three copies of Devourer of the Depths, and one or two copies of either Shipwreck, Hoarder, or Terror of the Tides. Jaw Hunters is where they get the chance to load up on Sea Monsters for the Nautilus turn while bridging the gap in the deck's weaknesses really well. I think that changing from an On Summon to a Last Breath punishes players for holding back their Jaw Hunters until a juicier target is played, making them play the card more aggressively as you'd expect out of a card statted like this. Currently, Sea Monsters is traditionally weakest between turns 4 and 6, more so turns 5 and 6, and that's really the only opportunity you have to gain some advantages to snowball against the deck, and Jaw Hunters makes that a lot harder, as it can just sit on board waiting for you to play a 4 or 5 cost unit for it to get max value, while still applying pressure with the randomly generated Sea Monster. This should bring the deck just a smidge more in line with other mid-range decks and make its weaknesses more exploitable. Indoor Spiders, of course, has made a big resurgence recently and probably shouldn't be called Indoor Spiders anymore, but I like keeping original naming conventions as decks evolve to preserve the history, even if it's a little confusing to newer players. So I have a couple of potential changes to Indoor here. Give them a set amount of health, I picked 8, though that might be a bit high since On Curve Indoor is currently a bit of a problem, though I wanted the health total where Indoor could survive one combat and need a removal spell to be finished off in order to make larger Indoors still feel impactful. It should probably be 7 health but that honestly just looked a little bit weird to me. You could change the Overwhelm to Regenerate, as that is also a Freljord keyword, and gives Endor the power to take over games but not end them, and still keeps the Atrocity potential alive, though I don't really like this one as much. Or you could up the cost to 7, as On Curve Endor does seem to be ending games about as often as the Atrocity combo, and would also delay the Atrocity Endor combo by another turn, turn 10 instead of turn 9, 
Earlier I mentioned that I would like Atrocity to 7. I don't want both cards to go to 7, as I do think it's important to be able to play them both in the same turn, but if they're not going to touch Atrocity, I think this seems most likely. So while I'm hoping that the Pilfer mechanic will get removed entirely, or at least reworked to make copies, or just draw off the bottom, or literally anything other than how it currently functions, in case they just go for nerfs, I think they'd be pretty straightforward. Remove the cost reduction from Black Market Merchant, as it makes the package entirely too efficient. Up Pilfered Goods to 3 mana, as it is currently too card efficient for its mana cost and probably not touch Yordle Grifter at all. The one problem that I do have with Yordle Grifter, and I've highlighted this before, is that he is the only Allegiance card to do something if you don't get the Allegiance off, and I think that Warning Shot is actually a pretty impactful thing for a deck like this to be getting. And if they do decide to remove or rework the Pilfer mechanic entirely, I think the cards that currently Pilfer would become more Warning Shot focused, like Yordle Grifter, my problem with that is that I don't think there are actually that many big payoff cards in Bilgewater for having multiple copies of Warning Shot. Sure, you have Riptide Rex, sure you can level up Gangplank a little bit faster, but I think we might be pigeonholding it a little bit too hard into Sejuani at that point, and I don't really like taking this flexible package and sort of shoving it into this one region only. Overall, there are a lot of things currently making this mechanic a little bit too strong. It's under-costed, Black Market Merchant makes it even more under-costed, you're stealing the cards from your opponent, you're taking them off the top so things like Omenhawk feel worse, and overall I think we're going to see mostly a cost reduction as well as maybe creating copies off of the top of your opponent's deck. One, so that your opponent doesn't feel bad for playing things like Omenhawk, they still get the copies of their cards, and two, you will have a little bit more counterplay against the mechanic as you will know exactly which cards were taken since you will draw them yourself. When balancing a combo deck, we usually hone in on two factors. How much interaction there is, slash how easy the combo is to stop, and what turn you can do the combo on, slash what turn it is killing its opponent on, versus what turn other decks are killing people on in the same format. Heimerdinger is an infinite value engine rather than an actual combo, but I think the same metrics apply. How much interaction is there? The answer is not a lot, since the cards that kill Heimerdinger usually cost as much if not more than him, and the things that protect him from these things are much cheaper. And what turn can you do it on? Turn 5, which seems a little early to be snowballing a death train of elusives. So there's a couple of approaches you can take. Number 1, you bump that bad boy up to 7 mana, a much more reasonable turn to be starting your death train. But I don't like this, as I've mentioned in the past, stat and mana cost changes are pretty boring overall, and I think Heimerdinger is a card that can't be fixed with a boring solution. You can try and rearrange the keywords on some turrets, which is the answer I see mentioned most often. You can swap the 2 and 3 cost turrets so that the elusive turrets are less plentiful and don't hit as hard. Or, you can make the elusive turrets more powerful, but a bit more difficult to obtain, limiting a player to one elusive per turn and making them work for it in their deck building. I'm not sure a direct swap is necessarily the best idea in that case, as 3 mana barrier turrets aren't actually that much worse than elusive turrets. You can block them now, it just feels really bad, and you feel like not open attacking versus Heimer is also scary because barrier blockers feel really bad to attack into. It creates a new set of problems. And of course, there's another, slightly less obvious problem with a turret rework. If you scroll through the turrets, you can see that their artwork makes them progressively larger in size and more threatening looking. The names of the turrets and their artwork also play a little bit into their abilities. For example, Floor Be Gone is elusive. Floor Be Gone implies it burrows, therefore it's hard to block, therefore elusive. As much as I like the 7 mana turret being elusive, the turret's name is Armored Stomper, and it doesn't look elusive in any sense of the word. It looks more like a tank. So they get into a lot of weird problems rearranging artwork and naming conventions that go beyond just balance changes internally, and it can be a big problem and really slow down the production. So I'm not sure we're going to see a rearrange of the turrets in a big way. MK2 and MK3 can probably safely swap their names and art since they're relatively close in size, since they're only one cost off, but a total rework is very unlikely. So personally, my long-term goal for Heimer would be to figure out how to branch him out into other regions. We've seen a couple of one-off non-Ionia Heimer decks in the past, but none of them really stick around. And in my balance patch review, I had mentioned the existence of two color cards in Runeterra, cards that feel like they're designed around only being played in a specific regional combination, like Yasuo. You can branch out, but it doesn't necessarily feel as good, and I don't feel like Heimerdinger was designed as one of these cards. The short-term problem is that Ionia offers way too much protection for Heimerdinger, and that protection offers too much value because of the turrets. The most optimal way to play Heimerdinger is to just play a bunch of protection spells for him and let the infinite value engine work its magic. So I think it's possible that Heimer doesn't actually get touched himself, but instead Ionia continues to see nerfs. 
but rather than kind of lay out to you the changes that I think could come to Twin Disciplines or Elixir of Brilliance or Will of Ionia or any of these defensive tools coming out of Heimerdinger, I'd rather not see Ionia suffer for Heimerdinger's sins. So if we take away Heimerdinger's turrets on burst spells, obviously he's a lot weaker. The protection spells no longer synergize with him, enticing you to move outside of Ionia, but I think it guts the identity of the card too much. He no longer synergizes with his champion spell, Heimerdinger's Progress Day, and while there are no 8 cost slow or fast spells in Ionia or Piltover, a big thermogenic beam does still give you access to T-Hex. I think this would be a pretty massive nerf and something else would have to compensate for it, likely a cost decrease to Heimerdinger himself and an increase to his health as well, but I think it's another option they have available. As I had mentioned previously, there's a lot of directions you can take this, and it's I'm not envious of the balance team that has to work on this. I think that there's a lot of ways that they could go, but I think moving towards something like this is going to be the most ideal if you want to see Heimerdinger finally leave Ionia. Now, I know I spent a lot of time actually talking about individual cards rather than going for a wide breadth of cards, but I did want to touch on a watchlist card of mine, and that's Crimson Disciple slash Imperial Demolitionist. Now, one of the reasons that I'm watchlisting this rather than saying it needs to get nerfed is because I don't think aggro is in a super oppressive state at the moment. I do think that as new aggro decks come out, people have to learn how to play against them individually, although I do think the elusive burn deck is a little bit high in power. I wouldn't be super surprised to see one of these cards get nerfed. I'm just not sure how they're going to do it, which is one of the reasons that I'm watchlisting it rather than proposing a nerf for it myself, but I do think that this is a little bit too powerful of a combination of cards for every burn deck to have access to, since they're both in the same region. And finally, I kind of wanted to wrap this video out uh, by bringing attention to the tweet from Alex Lee. Uh, for patch 1.4, which is the patch that I'm talking about now, Live Design is looking to spruce up a few epic cards that aren't seeing a ton of play, and we'd love your feedback. Now, I kind of wanted to touch on which ones I think are going to get buffed here. So I wanted to specifically touch on the launch set as I think the Rising Tides epics might take just a little bit longer to figure out even some of the underpowered ones. I'd definitely like to see the launch set ones get some love first. So one of the ones that I've seen mentioned was Silent Shadows here. I actually feel like this card is perfectly fine as is. If you are going to run an ephemeral deck, it's pretty likely that you're going to be Ionia Shadow Isle in order to get access to things like Deathmark, and Silent Shadows here actually feels like she fits into that deck pretty well. The problem is that the strategy around her is bad, not necessarily that the card itself is underpowered. Laurent Chevalier just got buffed last patch, but I think the problem with this card is that its attack is higher than its health. I'd rather see it go down to even something like one attack and just up to four or five health if I want to actually randomly create sort of, you know, other challengers with this card. But of course, the two that everybody wants to know about, Jay Madarda and Ren Shadowblade. So this is the change that I would make to Jay Madarda, knock down the attack by one and make it so that he can't be targeted. Honestly, not married to the attack reduction, just didn't like the idea of him ending the game in three attacks and a mystic shot as opposed to four attacks, especially because I think this card actually could see play in something like Karina Control if that's what it came down to. Now, the reason that I said can't be targeted instead of can't be targeted by your opponent's cards is because I think it's important that this card not get out of hand with things like Dawn and Dusk and Unyielding Spirit. So I think if you were going to make it so it can't be targeted, you would have to make it so that it can't be targeted by anyone instead of just one player. And for Ren Shadow Blade, which is personally a card that I absolutely love and would like to be able to play, I, I think just swapping around the stats is fine. The ability is really cool, but you don't want to make him too resilient to things like a combination of combat and removal spells. You really just want him to stay outside of removal spell range. So I think 7 health is a pretty good baseline for him. Thank you so much for watching. As I said, my name is Boulevard. I'm a caster. You can check me out on Twitter to get all the notifications on when I'm going live and things like that. Don't forget to subscribe for more tournament content, and let me know down below what you want to see nerfed in this upcoming patch. I feel like I didn't actually touch on too, too many cards. It's likely there's a lot of things that are going to get nerfed that I overlooked. I'm curious to see what you guys think as well, and I cannot wait to see how this patch impacts the tournament meta. Until then, take it easy.